This video is brought to you by Sayerite. Visit Sayerite.com for all your project supplies, tools, and instructions. A wire-hung canopy is a great idea. They can provide adjustable shade to make your outdoor living area comfortable, even on the hottest of sunny days. Want one for your outdoor living area? Watch this video tutorial and we'll show you how to sew it up and install it yourself. Almost all the materials and tools to do it can be found at Sayerite. Save some money and do it yourself with help from Sayerite. I'm Eric Grant from Sayerite and I'll be walking you through the process. First step, measuring your structure. Hi, I'm Eric Grant with Sayerite and we're underneath a pergola that I built last year. But as you can see, there is a lot of direct sunlight and it makes this environment not as enjoyable. So what we're gonna do in this video is show you how to build a wire hung canopy. It's a canopy system that will retract and also cover this area so that the sun is not so intense. It's an easy project that you can do yourself following this video tutorial. So let's get started and show you how to build a wire hung canopy. First off, we're gonna take some measurements of the pergola. We'll be using Sayerite's wire hung canopy calculator. Only two measurements are needed to determine how the wire hung canopy panels will work on your structure. That's the structure's width and length. Here we are measuring the structure's width. This is the area where we want the first and last panel of fabric to stop along the long edges of the panel. Notice it's up against the main beam of our structure where the eye bolts will be screwed in. The second measurement is the length of the structure. This measurement will help us determine the length of each canopy panel. This measurement is from one main beam to the other main beam. Our structure is 143 inches in length. However, we need to take into consideration the length of each eye bolt. Ours measures 1 and 1 8 inch. Each span will include two eye bolts. We need to subtract the eye's length from our length measurement. So our eye's length is 1.12 times two, since we have two of them, equals 2.25. So we'll take the length measurement and subtract 2.25 from it, and we'll enter that total into our calculator for the length measurement. Our structure's width is 162 inches. Our length is 140.75 inches, and we will pick a 54 inch wide fabric. We have entered those measurements into our calculator and it gives us every detail we need to make our panels and also what supplies we need to order for our particular size application, including the quantities of items. According to the calculator for our canopies, each panel will be 52 inches wide here. When you're entering your figures for your structure in the wire hung canopy calculator, sometimes fudging the width will make a difference in how many panels are required for your structure. For instance, for this structure, I entered 162 inches for our width, this direction. Now, if I enter 163, all of a sudden I need four panels instead of three. When I go to four panels, that will increase the cost of the hardware that I have to buy and also the amount of fabric that's required, thus costing me more money. So sometimes by making an adjustment to the width will make a big difference in how much money you have to spend. With that said, that also comes into play with the width of fabric that you select. For instance, if you choose a Sunbrella marine grade fabric in a 46 inch width, you may have to make more panels, thus costing you more money. However, if you choose a 60 inch width, you may save a lot of money because you'll probably not need as many panels. Now I love using two types of fabric for wire hung canopies and that's Sunbrella Marine Grade Fabric and Pfeifertex Plus. For this project we're going to be using Pfeifertex Plus and it's a 54 inch width fabric and using the measurements I have I only need three panels so it'll save me some money. Now that our structure and calculations are done, it's time to mark and install the eye bolts. The half inch EMT that we're using needs to be cut to size. Our panel width is 52 inches. We are only going to cut one pipe at this time. The others will be cut later on. 
we will be using this pipe to help us mark our structure for the installation of the hardware and wire cables that needs to be installed on our pergola. The half inch EMT conduit cuts easily with a hacksaw as seen here. We will cut the other pipes later on. We only need one for now. We've cut a half inch EMT pipe to the width of each of our panels. For us, it's 52 inches. Now we've already installed the eyes. This is a prelude to your installation of the eyes because I like to use the half inch EMT as my reference for all of the eyes down the entire sides of the pergola. So when I put it up here, what I need to do is, because I'm using an eye bolt with a nut and washer, I need to make, make sure that I'm not going to run into any hardware that will make it impossible for me to use a nut and washer on the back end. So what I determined for us is that we want this hardware to be installed about 8 inches from the end to avoid any obstacles like this post or this post here. And that puts our pergola right here, the finished fabric, and right here. So I'll mark, which I've already done, here where this eye bolt will go. Then I'll mark here where this eye bolt goes. And obviously those would be centered between this area. Then I'd use that as a reference for all other areas. Now in between each panel from this end where the fabric stops, we want at least three inches. We don't want the panels to be any closer than approximately three inches. So from here, I'll mark three inches and then I'll put my pipe right there on the next run and mark where this hardware goes. The reason I have the three inches between each of the panels is I don't want them hitting each other when there's a strong wind. So usually at least three inches is usually a safe factor to make sure that we aren't going to have panels blowing against each other back and forth. Here are some general guidelines you may want to go over. Now let's show installing the eye bolts. Using that pipe we cut, we will mark the beam with a pencil where we want each panel to start and where the eye bolt, which holds the wire, should be installed. Each run of wire should be between 3 to 8 inches inside the edge of each panel, as we discussed earlier. My two sons are helping. Their names are Silas and Seth. The end of the panel should also be marked. Now, that panel's hardware location is identified on our structure. Next, we will measure over about three inches from the end where the first panel's edge stops. We did not show it on this run, but we will be measuring down two inches from the top of the beam using a square soon. We will do this to make sure the hardware is horizontal in line with the top of our structure's beam. And now, follow that same procedure down the width of your structure for each of the panels. Be sure to start about three inches from the last panel's edge location. Here we'll show using a square to measure down approximately two inches from the top of our beam and mark where every one of the eye bolts needs to be installed with an X or a plus to indicate where we need to drill. Our structure has three panels, so we'll do this yet one more time. Then we'll repeat that same procedure for the other side of our structure. We will not show that. Where each eye bolt should be secured, we will drill through the wood frame using a 5 inch inch drill bit. Because our eye bolt has a 5 inch inch threaded post, and a washer and a nut will be used to secure it firmly in place on our wood beam. We are using a high quality stainless steel eye bolt with nut and washers from Sailrite. True, you could save money and buy eye bolts that are zinc plated from a hardware store, but they do not hold up to the weather very well, they rust, and for a high working load limit they usually are rather large. Our eye bolts have a working load of about a thousand yep. pounds and a breaking load of 3,968 pounds. Yeah. On the back side, the washer and nut that comes with our eye bolt is securely tightened in place. Use a screwdriver in the eye to keep the eye vertical as the nut is tightened. Okay. Hmm? 
Repeat this process for every location where an eye bolt needs to be secured to the beam, on this side and on the other. After Seth and Silas have all the eye bolts installed, next up we need to install the wire rope. This is a swedge tool to install Nicropress sleeves. This is the turnbuckle that we have for each one of our canopies or panels. So what we need to do is we need to take the Nicropress sleeve and install it onto the end of the cable on one side, run the cable through the eye, give yourself plenty and it's easier to work with, then run the end of the cable through the opposite side of the Nicropress sleeve. Once it's through the sleeve, we'll leave a little bit of a tail hanging out. Now we want to close up the eye, and to do that you want to pull on this side, not the side that only has a little bit hanging through. And there's no magic rule to the size of the eye, but I like to have it fairly small so it doesn't look so large. Now we'll take our swedge tool and we'll take out this one nut on the end. That will allow us to put the wire in between here and then put the nicker press sleeve between that other portion. What we want to do is we want to we want to create three presses on this nicker press sleeve. So the first press will be very close to the end as you can see here in that uh, concave area. So now we'll tighten down the screw so that it bites down on that and we'll tighten them fairly evenly. Obviously this one's looser than the other. We'll use a half inch closed wrench to do this job until I feel a little bit of pressure and then I'll check to see where my nicro press sleeve is positioned. Do the other one. Now I definitely have pl plenty of pressure down that it's going to hold it in place. It looks good and the eye looks like the right size. So now we're going to continue just to press it down firmly until these ends basically clamp down on, on the opposite end of the tool. This is an awesome device that does a beautiful job of pressing a nicro press sleeve. That side's down completely, that side, and that side is down. So our nicro press is pressed once. Now we just have to do that in the center location and then on the end. Once you release these nuts, you'll find they're, they quite easily reverse out. You can see how it's crimped it there. It's a beautiful crimp job. Now we'll put it back in, in about the middle position. So notice now, we've crimped this one end, now we're crimping in the center position, and it's positioned just about perfectly. I hope you can see that. Do the same procedure. There we are, down on that side, down on that side. Now I can release them with just a half turn or a quarter turn and they'll reverse out to the point where I can reposition the nicro press sleeve yet again. There's what it looks like. Beautiful crimp job. Last crimp near the end. Ooh, done. You know what? I'm going to get a drill and a socket and do the last one with that and show you how easy it is with that because that's a lot of twist. Now I need to release this screw completely to get the wire out or run the wire all the way through which I do not want to do. That screw is released. This one needs to be released enough that I can open the jaw. Take a look at that. That thing is not going anywhere. We're going to be going in this eye bolt to the next eye bolt on their side through the other eye bolt and then back through here, this eye bolt with the turnbuckle in the center. So I'm going to start at the end that doesn't have the turnbuckle through the eye here and then feed all this cable through this. I'm going to let this hang here, it's not going to go through there, and then I'm going to go to the other side with my ladder and string that up. So we're going to go in from this side over to this side. Then, while we're doing this, we might as well go through this last one and pull it through. When you start stringing this wire rope, if it gets next to your head, it does a good job of pulling a single hair out of your scalp. <laughs>
All right, we got through that side. Now I'm back over here. Here we are. We go through here. Feed the excess through. As you can see, each rectangle of wire will hold up one panel. Now what we want to do is we want to take this turnbuckle almost to the very end of its travel. So we have plenty to make adjustments with. So right about there, and we want to do the same thing with this one. It's a windy day out here today. Right there. Now we have the maximum amount for adjustment. Now, we'll take our cable and we'll pull it taut. With this pulled taut, both sides, we need to figure out where we need to cut the cable. Now we don't want to cut it clear over here, that would be too much cable. So we're actually going to go to the end of the eye and then basically about an inch to an inch and a half past the eye. I think I'm going to do it right about there. And that's where I will create my cut so that I have plenty to tension it to make the wire taut. So right here is where I will cut. All right, I've got uh, my Dremel tool with a heavy cutting wheel on it. And this is our point where we need to cut it. I've got my safety goggles on. That cuts it very nicely. Now, if you have a heavy duty wire cutter, you can use that as well. But most people don't have a heavy duty wire cutter that'll cut wire as cleanly as a Dremel tool and a cutting wheel. Now I have to hold on to this, this or I either feed it through maybe again and around itself. That may hold it there. What I wanna do now is I wanna take this into the turnbuckle out because I don't wanna have to be fighting all this uh, hardware. So I'm just going to unscrew it completely and let this side hang. Now I need to make sure that it's going through and fed appropriately. I'm going to put my tools on top of the pergola up here and my Nikra press sleeve. And this time I'm going to use some power. Put that up there too. Oh, look, I got a wrench up here. All kinds of goodies. Okay, so now we'll go back to this. And before I feed it through the eye, I have to put the Nikra press sleeve on, which I forgot to do. Nikra press sleeve through the eye, through the Nikra press sleeve. Because that end was cut with a Dremel tool, it went through a lot easier than the other end that was cut with wire cutters. This time I'm gonna use the power tool and I'll show you that. So let me get it set up and then I'll show you that next. See how I have it positioned again? Now let's see how it works with a power drill. I've never done it this way. This is a half inch socket. Ooh, nice. Look how fast it's going. It's already down. <laughs> I think I learned a lesson here. Now all we need to do is release it a little bit. All right, I don't think we need to show any more of this. You've got the idea how to do this. We'll uh, show you what to do after we get this uh, Nikra press sleeve all the way compressed three times. I'm gonna release this almost to the point where it's falling off because we wanna tighten them about the same rate. So there, it's just getting ready to fall off. Now we're gonna take this side and we're gonna connect it There we go. Now, what we want to do is we want to turn this center without these eye bolts turning. So we don't want to untwist the, the wire rope. So I'll put a, a screwdriver in this eye, which will keep it from turning, and then I will turn the center here and hold this eye by hand. So the cable is staying true, and the center of the turnbuckle is the only thing twisting to tension our cable. 
and we've got already some pretty good tension on and we have a huge amount of adjustment. Exactly what we want. Now we want this to be very taut and hopefully your structure is capable of holding all this pressure. If you're putting this on a weak structure, that's probably not a good idea. My arm's probably going to get in the way here, but you get the general idea. We want this taut. Love that sound. That's the sound I'm going for. There's going to be quite a bit of weight on this cable, but we don't want to pull down our structure either. So I'm going to keep it there, and then I'm going to take these nuts and bring them up on the centerpiece. Then I'll use my wrench and tighten up the nuts. We'll follow that same procedure for every one of the panels for the canopy. The wire runners are installed on our structure. It's now time to cut the fabric and sew it up. You may be asking yourself, how in the world are you going to sew large panels inside your home? It's not like we have a loft available for us, but it's really not that hard. All you need is a dining room table. I'm going to show you how easy it is. Come on inside. We have to lay out our fabric on the floor so we can measure it and cut it to the appropriate length for our panel. We are doing that on our living room floor here. To determine the length, we'll use the cut fabric length on the calculator. We'll mark that length with a pencil. Then we'll use a square and strike a straight line down the length of our fabric. To extend the length of the square, we'll use a yardstick that is laid over the square by about six or seven inches and then we'll continue to strike a line down the length, or I should say width, of our fabric. Since we're using a Pfeiffer Tex Plus mesh fabric, we can cut it with scissors. If you're using Sunbrella marine grade fabric, you may want to cut it with a hot knife to help prevent the unraveling of the fabric. We've got all this fabric here. Uh, this is about 177 inches approximately of fabric that's 54 inches wide. We're using a Pfeiffer Tex Plus. Okay, so we need to get started. How are we gonna do it? I've cleared this area of all the chairs and all I have is one chair for my sewing machine and the rest of my area is my workspace. So this is all that's needed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my fabric and I'm gonna th throw the majority on the floor and this end that we've cut straight already with using a square, we'll lay it on the table. You'll need to cut your panel to the right width we're using a 54 inch fabric and we want our panel to be 52 inches when it's finished. We want to create a single hem on both long edges of the fabric. So for us, we don't need to cut the fabric to size because we're going to fold it in one inch on one side, fold it in and one inch on the other, resulting in 52 inches. We're going to use the Serite canvas patterning ruler to create this hem. First off, we're going to measure it, mark our fabric with a pencil or a soapstone pencil or either a grease pencil, and then we'll fold it to those lines we'll create. So that's what we're going to do now. So we're going to create a one inch hem, and on this ruler there's a uh, hole at two inches. So we're going to create a line two inches from the edge. The line's kind of hard to see because the fabric doesn't mark very well, but it will be visible enough that we can actually create our single hem. So we'll be folding the edge of the fabric to that line. So we've done it for a small portion of the fabric here. Now we're going to go to the other side and do the same thing. Notice the edge of the Serite canvas patterning ruler has a metal piece that helps to guide the ruler up against the raw edge of the fabric. Now that we have that marked, we'll move the fabric now to where we stopped marking right here, and we'll use our Serac canvas patterning ruler yet again to strike another line that will be two inches from the edge of the fabric. If you don't have the Serac canvas patterning ruler, you can do it with a yardstick. We're going to show you that next. 
Okay, we've got it marked from there to there at the edge of our table. We'll just continue to move the fabric to the next part that we need to mark. Now we're going to use a yardstick and just place a line two inches from the edge on the fabric at a couple of locations and then we'll strike a line with it. If you need to cut the fabrics width down to size, that was not required for us, you would mark a line for cutting in the same manner as seen here. Then you would strike a two inch line in from that cut edge for a one inch hem. We'll just keep doing that all the way down the length of the fabric. We're going back to the Sarah canvas patterning ruler. We believe it's easier. We'll be using seam stick for canvas for the single hems along the long edges of each of our panels. This double sided tape will base the hem in place so we can take it to the sewing machine and sew it. Now there are only a few spots on each panel that will use this double sided tape and that is the two long edges and also the short sides. When we create our sleeves we don't want to use double sided tape. There we'll either pin or staple. Okay, here's our two inch line that we struck down. The fabric will be folded over to that two inch line. We're going to place our quarter inch seam stick for canvas about a quarter inch away from the edge of the fabric. Our stitch will go right here. Since we're using a PTFE thread, which is a lifetime guaranteed thread that never rots and colors stay true and chemicals don't affect it, it will last the lifetime of the fabric. If we were to sew into the actual seam stick, you may have a little bit more issues with the PTFE thread. That doesn't mean you can't sew into the double-sided seam stick, but avoiding the seam stick will make it more capable of sewing without skip stitches. So that's why I'm backing the seam stick off. Notice that as I'm doing this, I'm moving the panel on our small table so that I can base down approximately a three-foot section at a time easily. I don't need a huge workspace like we talked about earlier. So now we're on the other side and we're doing the same procedure again. We're coming to the end and what we'll do is we'll go all the way to the end and then you can use scissors to break it, or scissors to cut it, I'm sorry, or you can hold your finger on it and rip it like that. I like doing that because it, as you can see it left a little bit of the glue exposed. So now all I have to do is just grab the transfer paper here and pull it up and that reveals the glue. I'll pull up about uh, two feet, foot of it and then I will baste the edge of the fabric over to that line we struck down earlier. You can crease it with your hand, but why do that when you have the Sarite canvas patterning ruler? Do this with the metal end and it is creased and bonded beautifully. Um, you can't get a better crease than using the Sarac canvas patterning ruler. We're going to continue doing this entire side and then we'll move to the next side after we're done with this. Move the fabric down to where we peeled up the tape, pull back some more tape, and then baste it first right to your line that you struck down. This gives you a perfect one inch hem. As we discussed earlier, Pfeiffer-Tex fabric can be cut with scissors without having to worry about unraveling. Right to there. You can either do it with your hand, but uh, we'll use the Cassera canvas patterning ruler. If using a Sumbrella marine grade or awning grade fabric, and you do not have to cut it to size along the salvage edge, those edges are factory sealed and typically they do not unravel. However, if umbrella fabric has to be cut to size, we recommend using a hot knife to help prevent the unraveling. Here we are on the opposite side. Peel off our transfer paper, revealing the glue, base to the line. Whoop, a little bit too far in. Nice thing about double sided tape, you just pull it up and reapply. Now that we have the two hems basted, we need to confirm our measurements before we sew them. So it's always a good idea to do this. We're going for 52 inches. Yours may be different. We're a smidge over 52, which is perfect. You don't have to be exact on this thing. We're ready to sew our hems in place. 
All right, we're gonna take our fabric and get it ready for sewing. And there's a lot of fabric here. We're gonna start with one side, doesn't matter which side, and we're gonna sew it with the hem up. Here's our front edge, and we'll put her in the machine and get started. We're going to position our magnetic guide here on the Sayerite Ultrafeed LSZ sewing machine so that we get our stitch about an eighth inch away from our raw edge. So right about there. And uh, that's perfect. So now I'm going to do some sewing here. About an inch. And then I'm going to put the machine in reverse with this lever. And that locks the stitch in place. Now we're going to sew down the length of our hem. I'm going to bury the needle to the thickest part of the shaft as you can see there and I rotated the balance wheel around by hand to do that. Now that's going to keep my fabric right where I want it and then I'm going to adjust my fabric. But before we do that we need to look at our stitch on the back side to make sure it looks good. Before we stitch too far we should always lift up our fabric and inspect the stitch on the bottom side to make sure it looks good. We don't want too much tension and we don't want too little tension. If there's too little tension on the back side you'll see loops or loose thread. Here it looks excellent so I think we're in good shape. We've got our needle buried in our fabric right at the beginning of our hem. It's not a bad idea to take your fabric and actually kind of stretch it out in an excess room if you have it. It doesn't have to be perfectly flat, but the flatter you make it, the easier it is going to be to sew it. Now, if you don't have a lot of room, you can gently roll the fabric so that it folds right where you're working and it will feed easier into the sewing machine. Let's, we're ready to sew. Now you can see that this magnetic fence acts like a, a fence on a table saw. You just basically keep the fabric edge up against it and your stitch stays nice and true. Notice that when I'm sewing where my hands are. One hand's over here guiding the fabric and the other hand is over here kind of helping to push the fabric and that keeps my fabric feeding where I want it to because you do have to stay in control of your fabric. It's not going to feed it perfectly straight without your hands. So watch as I do this. My needle's buried so I'm not going to lose my spot. I'll move my hands. I'll bury my needle if I make adjustments to the fabric by rolling the balance wheel by hand and move my hands yet again. Hands go down, hand over in front here, sewing about a foot and a half to two foot. Keeping the fabric up against the magnetic guide. Now is probably a good time to talk about profilin thread and polyester thread. We're using a PTFE thread called Profilin. A Profilin thread is a lifetime guaranteed thread and it will not rot uh, and chemicals do not affect it. So if you're in a tropical environment, say California or uh, Florida or even the Caribbean or any place like that, using a PTFE thread like Profilin is a phenomenal idea and highly recommended. If you're not in a tropical environment like here in Indiana, the weather's kind of mild and the sun is not so intense. You could get away with a V92 polyester thread. A polyester thread in a mild climate like this will last anywhere from three to eight years. In a very high intense UV climate like in the Caribbean, the polyester thread may only last a year, two years, maybe three years, and that's it. So you may want to choose a PTFE thread like Profilin. A PTFE thread is more difficult to sew with. You may get a few skip stitches. There are some things you can do to tweak the sewing machine so that it sews a little bit better, like using a smaller needle. Since the thread is a little bit slippery and it also kinks slightly, 
using a smaller needle will sometimes cause the thread to bind better in the hole that the needle creates. And when the needle exits the hole, a better loop is formed for the hook to catch. Let's get started sewing again. Can this type of fabric be sewn with a regular home sewing machine? To help determine that fact, you can cut up a pair of old blue jeans, not including the jeans hems, then stack about four or five layers on top of itself, and then sew it with a heavy thread. Chances are, if the stitch looks good on the top side and the bottom side, you can sew Pfeiffer Tex and Sunbrella fabric with your home sewing machine. If not, consider buying Sayerite's Ultra Feed Sewing Machine. Check them out at www.sayerite.com. All right, we have the two long edges hemmed with a single one inch hem and they're now sewing. So we're gonna turn our attention to one of the short ends. And first off, we have to make sure that it's at a 90 degree angle to the edges. So we'll need a square. Okay, we use a square and our sides are straight and as you can see, we're a little bit off here. So we're gonna strike a line here along the fabric. To prolong the square, we'll put this yardstick about uh, six or seven inches on this and that prolongs our line. So now we'll strike a line on this. Then we'll cut along that line. Now we'll strike a one inch line all along the edge of the fabric so that we can create a half inch hem. This is the one edge that can be basted along with the long edges. So this basting tape will allow us to baste this half inch hem in place so we can take it to the sewing machine and sew it and not have to worry about creating it while we're sewing. We're just folding the edge of the fabric up to that line that we just struck on, creating our half inch hem. Now we can take it to the sewing machine and sew, which is probably not a bad idea, or if you crease it really well, you can actually just not sew it and sew it in the next step. It's creased well, it's basted down, we should probably check it with our square to make sure that it's perfectly square. That looks really good. And that too looks good too. It's very important to get an edge that's squared because every single sleeve that's created down the length of your panel needs to be straight. If you start with a crooked edge, then every single sleeve will be crooked down the entire length. Next, along that half inch hem, Along the fold, we're going to strike a line that is three inches from the folded edge. We're not going to use seam stick for this sleeve. We're actually going to use a stapler and staple the fabric in place. You could also use T-pins. If you were to use seam stick, the glue or residue may be in your sleeve when you're trying to push your pipe through and it may be difficult, if not impossible, to push it through. So we're going to use a stapler. You could also use T-pins. We're going to take this and we're going to fold it to our line. Then we're going to crease little sections of about one inch at each one of those lo um, locations. This kind of just gives us a little bit of a guide so that we can crease the fabric completely in the next step. Okay, once we have our preliminary scoring of the fabric done, we'll go over it again and crease it so it has a very good memory. Once that's done, we'll take our stapler and we will staple about halfway in the middle of that, about every six to eight inches. Let's confirm our sleeve by measuring it. It should equal about one and three eighths inch to one and a half inch, and it does. All right, we, we need to place our magnetic guide one and five sixteenths inch away from the needle. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lower my needle by rotating the balance wheel to one and five sixteenths and place it 
nearly on top of the yard stick. Then I'm going to position, oops, one and five sixteenths is right here. <laughs> then I'm going to position my magnetic guide right up against the edge of the ruler. So now I have exactly one and five sixteenths inch from the needle. Then I can clear my ruler, my magnet set. Now I'm going to take my fabric where that first sleeve is created and put it in the sewing machine and sew along that edge. We should be very close to that edge as you can see we are here in the video. Do a little reversing at the end and just sew down a slink. We're keeping the edge up against the magnetic guide. That's our guide. I'm kind of lifting the fabric as I sew here to kind of let the machine pull it in. So I'm guiding it here and over here I'm kind of lifting the fabric so that it feeds nice and straight. And then when we get to the end we do some reversing. And our first sleeve is created. Next we're going to pull out these staples and we're just using a screwdriver to pull them out. And then we'll use some needle nose to pull it out. Our first sleeve is created. Now we need to go back to the calculator and confirm our span. We're using our iPhone here to get to the internet and we have landed on the Sarite uh, wire hung canopy calculator. This is what we use to calculate everything for our uh, wire hung canopy. And it says that each span for my canopy will be 27.45 inches. That's from sleeve to sleeve. Yours may be different depending on obviously your pergola or your structure that you're applying these wire hung canopies on. Here's a snapshot of the calculator. And here you can see each span will be 27.45 inches for our application. Yours may be different. To make things easier, I like to take a permanent marker and mark on my yardstick at my span measurement. Ours is 27.45 inches. So as you can see, I placed a black mark there. That way I always know exactly where I need to mark. We need to put our hems facing down against the table. So we're going to roll our fabric around so that the hems are facing down. To do this, Make sure the fabric underneath the table, there's a lot of it, is going the same direction. That'll make it easier for the creation of these sleeves. The main reason that I'm turning the hems so they're facing the table is because I don't want the hems to be up facing the sky. The uh, idea here is that if the hems are under, dirt can't get caught on the edges of any of our hems. So when it fills with water, and if water comes to the sides, it doesn't get caught along the edges of the hem, it basically rolls over the sides. True, you're going to see the hems from the underside, but if you've done a good job, they'll still look great. Now, is that a rule? Not at all. It's a preference. So if you'd like to have your hems facing up the sky, then simply make sure that you do this step with the hems facing away from the table. It's your choice. So now I'm going to place my yardstick right at the edge of the fold and mark it our span distance which we've marked on the yardstick. I'll do this in three spots. Center and the two sides. So that's three spots. Now we'll strike a line connecting those marks. What we're going to do now is we're going to grab our fabric at our mark and we're going to tuck the front portion under at the line we're going to create a fold right at this edge first doesn't really matter which side you do it on but just want to start it on a side there's our line i'm going to hold it with my finger right on the line then i'm going to make sure the fabric is flat and the edges are lined up perfectly. That way I have a perfect 90 degree turn with those two edges. You can see this is right on top of that other one. I'm going to take my 
um, stapler, and I'm going to staple about a foot and a half down from the fold and about two inches in. There's no magic number for that. We're just trying to keep those pieces of fabric directly on top of each other. Then I'm going to follow that same procedure for this side. I'll find my mark and I'll fold right on that mark and hold the fabric. Make sure the fabric's laying flat and then make sure the edge just of the fabric are directly on top of each other as best as possible. Then I'll staple the fabric in place. Now, if we've done it right, all we have to do is just basically keep the fabric flat because our staples are holding it in place and create a memory creased edge along here. Everything's flat, edges are lined up, we have a sort of a memory from my hand. Now, if you don't have the Sarah Canvas Patterning Ruler, you can crease it like this, or you can use another object. I'd probably use a screwdriver like this and crease the edge like this. But as you can see, it's well worth having the Sarah Canvas Patterning Ruler to crease fabric. By far the easiest tool. I'm keeping the ruler from scratching the table by applying the pressure right up against the, the fabric. But if you really like your table, <laughs> you may want to put something down sacrificial. I don't really care that much for this table anymore. It's about 30 years old. With that done, we're going to take our stapler and we're going to staple in approximately one inch about every six to eight inches again. This secures the sleeve, so when we take it to the sewing machine and sew, it doesn't move around on us. There we go. Next up, we sew it. So now we'll take our panel to the sewing machine. The magnetic guide is already set up for our 1 and 5 16 inch sleeve. So all we have to do is keep the fabric up against that edge. There's no reason to measure for this. As long as the fabric is creased well and stays in place, you should be able to sew right along there. It's always a good idea to reduce some reversing at the beginning because that's where the stress is going to be. When I reach the end, a little bit of reversing. Our second sleeve is now created. Now we'll repeat that process all the way down the length of our panel until we reach the last sleeve. There we'll do something special. We'll show this one more time. Don't forget to pull the staples here at the ends as well. If you sew through a staple, don't be alarmed. Just take your time and carefully pull it out without hopefully ripping any of the stitches. If you do rip stitches, you can always go back over them again. We'll now take our panel and we'll measure over that amount again. And strike a line. Now, take a look at this. This is pretty neat. If the fabric is laying with the, the sleeve going this direction. Now the sleeve may actually accidentally go this way on the succeeding panels, but if it's laying forward, you can see that our mark is right on the edge, and that's exactly what it should be. So for every one of these sleeves you create, if you're measuring right, that mark should be right where the edge of that last sleeve is. With that sleeve done, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna grab it at that location, not grabbing the under layer, and lift it up and push the other portion of the fabric away from me. Now, here's what I was talking about. If the sleeve is pushed that way, obviously our line won't be there. But if our sleeve is pushed this way, on this succeeding one, when we do that one, the line will be right here. So there's how the sleeve should be pushed. It doesn't really matter, but it's just a, it's a confirming uh, aspect to show that you're doing it right. So now again, we're going to find this line. I'm going to crease it. I'm going to hold on the line. 
I'm going to pull that fabric over so it's directly on top of the other one so we have a perfectly straight edge. I'm going to go in about a foot and a half, two inches in and staple. Do the same thing over here. This is a very easy project. A little time consuming, but very easy. Fabrics on top of itself. Staple. Crease the fabric, making sure everything's nice and flat. Then score the fabric. Once it has a good memory, we'll staple about every six or eight inches, about one inch in. Here we go again. One of the nice things about this project and what makes it so easy is using one of these great sewing machines. The Sarah Alter Feed sewing machine is really the world's best portable walking foot sewing machine. You won't find anything better. We're using the Sarah Alter Feed LS Z-1. This is a straight stitch and zigzag sewing machine. Sarah also carries a red sewing machine called the Sarah Alter Feed LS1. It's a straight stitch only machine and is a little bit less money. You don't need a zigzag stitch when you're doing a project like this. Follow that same procedure for all intermediate sleeves until the last one. We are on the last sleeve here, obviously near the very end of our fabric. So now we need to measure over our span length as we did for all of the sleeves or pockets if you want to call them that. And we need to add two inches. That'll be used for our uh, ha half inch hem and also the, obviously the other side of the pocket. So let's first measure over our span. Span for us, again, is right where we marked on a yardstick. And we'll measure that at three spots and strike a line. Now, from that span line we just marked, we need to place another line that measures over two inches more from the first line. And we will put three marks on the fabric, one on each end and one in the center. This is two inches down from that span line. Then we'll strike a new line that distance from the first line, line striking through the marks we just placed on the fabric. This will be our cut line. And we will cut this with scissors. Be sure to only cut through the top surface of fabric. If you have fabric underneath, don't accidentally cut it. Our hems are facing down. We're going to actually flip this fabric so the hems face up and place double-sided tape right at the edge of this fabric. So I'm placing the double-sided tape right along the edge of the fabric. So I did not strike a line. I'm just going to remove the basting tape. And then I'm going to fold the fabric back to approximately a half inch. And I'm going to eye this. I do a pretty good job of eyeing things to make sure that they aren't creeping on me. If you'd like, you could strike a line on the fabric and follow that line. Now we'll take our Sarite canvas patterning ruler and we'll crease that half inch hem so it has a good memory. and it stays basted nicely because of that. All right, now we have that half inch hem. Now we'll find our line and we'll fold directly on that line. I'm folding by hand first to kind of give it a little bit of a crease there. I didn't sew my hem in place. Um, because I just creased it well and it's basted. If you'd like, you could sew the hem 
so it doesn't come undone, but I think it's an extra step that's not necessary. So once it's been creased with your fingers, we'll crease it with a heavy object so it has a memory that stays permanent or more permanent because I don't think it'll stay there forever. <laughs> once that's done, we'll take our stapler and we'll staple just like we did with all the other sleeves. So that is our last sleeve. You can see the half inch hem, the pocket, and the finished side here. The last sleeve has the magnetic guide in the right spot. We're going to sew in our hem and also the sleeve at the same time. As with any other sleeve, be sure to do some reversing at the beginning and the end to lock your stitch in place. Then we'll use that guide to guide our fabric. Beautiful. Pfeiffertex Plus is a vinyl coated mesh fabric and it does allow air to flow through the fabric. After a rain, water may sit on top of the fabric due to the natural water adhesion and cohesion factors that are normal in any situation. However, since the fabric is a mesh, the water will eventually pass through or dry out quickly due to the high breathability of the mesh fabric. If you used a umbrella marine grade fabric, those fabrics are water resistant and water will pool up, especially on each one of these swags. So what we need to do is install a single spur grommet right in the center of each one of these areas. You'll need to install a number two spur grommet in the middle of every span. Let me show you what I mean. This is a span from sleeve to sleeve. The pipes have not yet been installed. In the middle, you would fold this fabric so the tops are even, and this is the middle of the span right here. And either measure it or fold it in half this direction, and there's your middle here. So you could crease it kind of with your fingers if you'd like. There's a middle mark, and then if you'd like, you could fold it here. Bingo, right there. You'd install a number two spur grommet, being sure that you only go through one layer of fabric. If you're using Sunbrella fabric, you need to install a grommet between each span. Here we've marked the center of this grommet on our Sunbrella fabric. This is just a sample piece to show you how it's done. You can use a razor blade and cut an X and then insert the male portion of the grommet through the hole that the X creates. This is not as clean of a system as using a hole cutter, which we will show next, but it does work. If you'd like, you can cut out the triangle of the X with scissors. That will make it a little bit cleaner. Once you get the male portion through, put the female portion with the spurs on top of that. Then we'll use the die set and we use a heavy mallet and pound it until the grommet is set appropriately in the single layer of Sunbrella fabric. Now we'll demonstrate using a number two hole cutter and we're using the premium cutting block on the underside to prevent damage to the hole cutter. We use the mallet again to punch our hole and this hole is very cleanly done. Then we'll use that number two spur grommet again and insert the male portion through the hole, place the female portion on top of the single layer of Sunbrella marine grade or awning grade fabric, then use the die set and give it a few hard, solid blows until the grommet is set appropriately in the fabric. Again, this is not necessary for Pfeiffertex or Pfeiffertex Plus fabrics, only Sunbrella. Oh, one more thing. That grommet needs to go in every single one of these swags to allow the water to escape. All of our panels or canopies are complete. Up next, we need to prepare the pipes. The half inch EMT that we're using needs to be cut to size. Our panel width is 52 inches. Mark it a little bit less than 52 inches because we want the pipe to be a little bit smaller than the pocket. 
The half-inch EMT conduit cuts easily with a hacksaw, as seen here. After all the pipes are cut to size, use a metal file and clean up the edges. There, most of the outside edges are nice and smooth now. So it's ready to be used. In lieu of a hacksaw, we could use a tubing cutter. I've got this vise out here. It's not actually mounted to this plastic table, but my wife didn't want me to do this inside for fear of scratching up the house. I don't blame her. I'm gonna put a rag in here and then tighten the vise to hold the half inch EMT in place while I get ready to cut it. We can cut it with a hacksaw as we showed earlier, or we can cut it with a pipe cutter. Put it on the pipe there's our mark that we need to cut it at and we'll just put the blade right by that mark and then we just tighten this wheel as we spin the pipe cutter Now if you take a look at the end of the pipe, you'll notice it's a pretty clean cut. So that's what a pipe cutter does in lieu of a hacksaw. We might want to still file the edges of this a little bit. I've used half inch EMT on a lot of awning projects on homes throughout the years. And I've not had any corrosion issues or rust issues on the outside. Where I've cut it, I've had a little bit of rust. It's not really any serious matter. But if you want to prevent rust from happening on the cut edges that you created, you can use a, a Rust-Oleum uh, cold galvanized compound repair, basically spray paint. After your pipe's been cut to size, which should be the width of your canopy or the width of each of your panels, you need to determine where each one of the strap eyes are going to be positioned on the pipe. And to do that, we need to go back out to the pergola or structure that you've uh, erected your wire on and measure the distance from one wire to the other. Our canopy will go in here, approximately over to here. We need to measure from one side of the cable to the other to get a measurement. So I'm just going to take my tape measure, measure over to that, and as you can see this one is 36 inches. So that's where we'll need to put our strap eyes. I advise doing the drilling of the pipe outside on a surface that you don't care about ruining, a sacrificial surface, thus the plastic table. All right, we know that we have the wires spaced at 36 inches for our project. Yours may be different. We know that our sleeves, as far as the width go, are 52 inches. So 52 minus 36 is 16. Divide that by two, and that's eight inches. So we should be able to find the 36 center for our pipes at eight inches from each end. So let's do that now. If you look at the half inch EMT pipe, you'll see a weld line that rides all the way up the, the length of the pipe. And if you look down the pipe, you'll see that it's perfectly straight, right on top of the pipe. We will use that as a reference to where we're going to drill our holes so that the holes are always in the same location on the top of the pipe. We want to mark this pipe on that weld. So we're going to measure 8 inches over and put a mark on that weld at 8 inches over. It's right there. Then we'll do the same to the other side. So there's our weld point right there and there's 8 inches. So we mark it right there on top of that. Next, what we'll do is we'll take this strap eye and place it on top of that mark, right on top of that uh, weld point with the mark in the center of the strap eye. So the, the strap eye is on our weld point, and then we mark right in the center on both sides. And then we'll do that same thing on the other side. Using an eighth inch drill bit, we will drill right on top of the weld 
at each one of those marks for the strap eye. We will not drill through the other side, only one side. There's our weld mark, so we know that it's right in line with the pipe. Now what we'll do is we'll take every single pipe that we have for our single panel and line it up so the weld point is at the top. Then we'll take our marker and we will mark where the holes go so they're directly across from the holes we just drilled. And it's a good idea to confirm that those holes are in the right spot by testing the holes you already drilled. And yep, they're in the perfect spot if you can see that in the video. So there's one marked. Now we'll take a second one, or a third one, I'm sorry. We'll find that weld point. There it is. We'll line up the ends over here on this side because it has to be even. And then we'll use those marks to mark directly across from those. And we'll do this on all ends of the pipe for every single one of them. Then we'll drill through those holes. There's the weld point lined up on the end, mark the holes. Every once in a while, take your strap by and confirm that the holes are in the right spot. So there you can see all the holes are drilled on this side and also they're all drilled over here. For our wire hung canopy, we have six spans for ours. That means we need seven lengths of pipe for each panel we have three panels, so we have to do this two more times. We're not gonna show that. Next up, we need to install the pipes and our hardware. We're back inside now where the air conditioning's on, and we've already have all of our pipes drilled for this one panel with the two holes that are pre-drilled at the appropriate spot. So we're now ready to install them in our canopy. We're gonna do one at a time but the process for all of them is exactly the same. So after I show you a couple, you should have this down pat. We'll start with the first sleeve. Which end do, should you start with? It doesn't really matter. With the pipe centered along this first sleeve, making sure that the ends are even, usually the pipes are slightly smaller than the panel, we will mark right on the fold, directly across from those holes on the fabric. And we'll do that on this side and also the other of this pocket. So I've not moved my pipe. That's important to make sure that the holes are going to be exactly in the right spot when we're done because we're going to make holes in this. So I've got those two positions marked on both sides. Now I'm going to move the pipe out of the way and I'm going to use this cutting pad and put it underneath the fabric making sure that I don't have any extra fabric under there because we only want to go through the fold of the pocket. Then I'm going to place my uh, cutter so that it creates a half moon cut and use a hammer like that, right over top of those holes that we marked. I'm going to do the same thing over here. There we go. The first sleeve has the half inch hem on it, so it'll be a little bit more difficult to slide the pipe into it because of that half inch sleeve. You might want to get a helper to help with this. It will be a little bit of a tight fit. You can roll the pipe around to help it kind of push into the sleeve. There we go. I'm not going to worry about where the holes are until I get almost to the other end. So now I'm almost there. So now I'm going to try to find my holes. Here they are. And I'm going to try to keep those positioned so that when they go through the sleeve, they'll be in line with these holes. So I'll keep pushing it in. Now if you, the pipe is flush with this side right here, but we're not all the way in. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grasp the fabric over here and kind of pull on the fabric, which you can see the pipe came out that end and I have a wrinkle here in the middle. So what I can do now is I can kind of do that down the length and that now the pipe is in all the way and I can push the fabric out to make it so that the pipe is now buried within our sleeve on both ends. Now to find the holes, because they're not quite visible yet here, I'm going to take a pair of needle nose pliers and grab my pipe and roll it around until I find those holes. There they are. And I'm going to do that only on one side. So I'm going to line up these holes and I've used my needle nose pliers to do that over here by grabbing the pipe. Now I can put my strap eye and my fixed snap eye onto that side. I'm using number eight self tapping screws or drilling screws and I'm going to feed kind of hand put the screw in there to kind of start it and then drive it mostly down. Not all the way. Then I'm going to put on my snap so that the snap is facing towards the inside or the middle of the canopy or panel. Okay, so the snap is facing that direction. Then I'll take a second screw and hand start it in that same hole and drive it into place. Now I can position them down hard. And that is now installed. Now we'll move to the other side and show this one more time. All right, I'll grab my pipe with my needle nose pliers, find the holes right there, they're lined up perfectly. And I'll follow that same procedure yet again. Snap goes on so that it opens towards the middle again. Just like that. There we go. Now, if it's done appropriately, they should be on top of the fold, which they are, and they should be fairly straight. That's one sleeve done. This is the end. What I want to do is I want to fold it so that I see the next fold. So I'm going to fold the fabric back this way. And you can see I'm working with another sleeve and it's laying flat on the table with nothing underneath it. So I'm assured that I won't go through another layer of fabric by mistake. I'll grab the next pipe, follow the same procedure. We'll show this in double time. Mark the fold with the pipe laying beside it at each hole location. Then use a hole cutter right on that fold and create holes as seen here in the video. Here's a helpful tip. Here are the holes directly on top. Once we get the pipe in, you can't really tell where the bottom is. You could use a permanent marker and mark a line so that you know that that's the bottom of the pipe which will help you align the holes and find them. There's the mark we made on the bottom of the pipe. So if I grab my needle nose and I roll it around to basically where the seam is, that should be the top of the pipe. And if you look at our holes, they are now showing. Screw it part way down. Put our fixed strap eye with the snap on towards the middle. Next screw into position. And screw it down all the way, both screws. All of our sleeves have a pipe and also all the fittings attached. We're now on the last sleeve. This last sleeve, we want to install a strap eye in the middle of this sleeve so that we can attach our rope pulley system. So what I've done is I've measured the tubing already to the center location, which for us is 26 inches. Then I marked on the weld line that's directly in line with the lines or with the holes that we drilled for our regular snaps. So on that weld line in the middle with that 
with that mark in the middle of the strap by, I'm going to mark again for two more holes. There and there. Now, I did this outside last time to prevent damage to my tabletop, but my wife's not home. So I'm going to use my cutting pad and drill through it here on the table and be, be as careful as possible. So drilling holes right on top of that weld. Just like we did earlier. Pipe centered. Mark the folds just as we did previously. Except for this time you're going to mark the folds in the center as well. And then you're going to punch holes there along with the sides. Now for the middle position, we don't need anything besides the strap eye. So for the middle position, on our last sleeve, we have just a single strap eye. And then on the ends, we'll install our regular strap eyes with the snap hooks. We haven't done that yet. As you can see, the process is easy. Next, we'll hang the panels. You notice the panels on the ground, and we have our sleeve that has the strap eye in the middle on top. Now get a helper here to help with this. So Tabby, would you grab that sleeve with the strap eye on it? There it is. You can see it right there. She's going to hand it up to me. I'm going to get on my ladder, and then she's going to continue just to help me to string it up. All we do is we take these hooks, and we simply just strap it over the wire on both sides. Once that's done, we'll push this down because this is the uh, end that goes towards the camera. I'll grab my second, second sleeve, which you probably can't see, and Tabby's helping me to hold the fabric up and strap it on in the same manner. Push it down. It is that simple. So this is an easy thing to take down and put up. and our last sleeve. Coming up next is the optional pulley and rope system chapter. This system will allow you to open and close the canopy panels via a control line. This system is optional, but highly recommended. Here, you can see it working. One rope or line can control up to three canopy panels. If more than three panels are utilized, we recommend using a second control line. If this pulley and rope system is not utilized, a webbing strap can be used so it can be opened by hand. Let's get started and show you how to install the pulley and rope system. The cheek block here on this post is mounted approximately at my chest level. There's no right rhyme or reason why I did that. I just didn't want little kids to mess with it. So, and it noticed that the block is at the upper portion and the opening for the block is at the bottom. That way the line can run down and around and up. We've installed a bullet block here. This will be our control line. And then up here, we installed a micro block, a double block. But you can see the strap by was put in at an angle here. This is the micro double block that will control the two lines that come down our post to our cheek block down below here. In the middle of these runs, or close to it, on the end where we are going to have our line that controls the entire canopy system, we want to install a micro double block. And I've installed it using a strap eye and two stainless steel screws that I screwed into the wood. Also take note of how the double micro block is installed. It's installed so the lines go horizontal with our structure. We'll need to do this at each run on the side that has the control line that comes down the post. We did not show it, but here you can see all of the double blocks installed on this side of our pergola, right in the center position for each one of the canopy panels. Now on the end that does not have the control line coming down the post, we need to install a Harkin micro block single. And we'll install that so that the block runs vertical as seen here. Now try to get the block as high as you possibly can within a few inches of your wire cable. Here we don't have much space, so we're 
only an inch or so above that. These blocks, again, should be centered between the span. Ours is 36 inches, so this is approximately 18 inches. Now, if you have something that's in the way, an obstacle, feel free to move it to the side to avoid the obstacle. Here we were fine. Now we need to do that on every single span on this side with a single micro block. Up next, we need to run the rope through the blocks, but first we'll melt the end of the rope to keep it from unraveling. We recommend a braided Dacron leech line from Sailrite. We have our line here, and the first step is to tie off to our strap eye right here. So to do that, I'm going to do a bowline. To teach the tying of a bowline is to imagine the end of the rope is the rabbit, and where the knot will begin on the standing part, a tree trunk. First, a loop is made near the end of the rope, which will act as the rabbit's hole. Then the rabbit comes up the hole, goes round the tree, then back down the hole. This can be taught to children with the rhyme, up through the rabbit hole, round the big tree, down the rabbit hole, and off he goes. Now that this bowline knot is tied, we'll take the remainder of the line and put it over top of our canopy as such like this. This is step one. Step two is going to be done over there. All right, we have the end of our line. We're going to go through the top of this double block in that direction. Then we'll pull all of our line through. All of our line is through the block. And you can see this line, if you look at that over there, pulls our whole awning in this direction. That's step two. Step three is over here. Step three, make sure that your line is above this cable. So we'll have to go above it here. Then we'll feed through the top portion of this block in this direction. Then we'll pull all the cable through. Okay, we have all of our line pulled through, and as you can see, the cable, or the line, or the rope, is running above this hardware. That's step three. Now step four is down below. And step four, run the cable all the way through this block. Step four is done. Now we'll lead up to that block we were just at. Step five, through the back side or underside of this double block. And then pull the line through. Now this line has to go above this hardware. So right over here laying beside this other one. So I'm gonna gather the line and throw it over that. So now I'm going to take all this line, I'm going to step up one more time, and feed it over this cable. And then I'll assure that it's not twisted anywhere. As you can see here, it's nice and straight. I'm going to go underneath this. We're not going to run through the block. We're going to skip it. And then I'm going to go over this cable with this. And then always check your line to make sure that it's not kinked anywhere or caught anywhere, and it's not. So that's perfect. So we'll continue to do this all the way down the line. I'm gonna take this cord and go over top of here, through here. Looks good. We don't need to really worry about this, but I'm gonna tuck it under there. Then I'm gonna go through here. Good, and then we'll keep going. Through this one, we got a nice straight run there. Now we need to go through this block. That's step six. Now we'll take the end of the line and we'll run it through the bottom of this double block and pull it all through. All right, that's step six. 
next to step seven, which is at the opposite side of the pergola. The steps for this pulley and rope system shown are for three canopy panel runs. The control lines become more difficult to pull with each additional canopy panel. If more than three panels are needed, we recommend an additional pulley and rope system be added. I've gathered the rope or the leech line and I'm going to go over the top of this awning or panel. There you can see. Now I'm going to drop it and move to that side. All right, step seven. We're going to go through the top of this single block and we're going to go through the bottom like this and we're going to pull all the line through. That's step seven. Step eight is to tie off to the awning. So on this side of our pergola, we have the control line that's coming down this post. So this is the control line side. We're going to go to the other side and push all of our canopies or panels towards that side. And I'm going to use this rod to do that. Up against the structure. Up against the structure. All right, all of our panels are pushed up against the structure on the side that does not have a control line. Now, what we need to do is we need to mark, we need to take this cable down here and we need to pull it taut without obviously pulling any of the, that canopy away from the structure. So we have all of our line taut. I will take the line directly under here. I will take that with my hand and what I will do is I'll mark that position with a twisty tie. So I'm going to take this bread tie well, while it's pulled fairly taut and twist it around the line. Now I know my hands are in the way. Don't worry about that. I'll show you this when we're done. Okay, so my twisty tie is on the rope. Notice when I pull the line, it's right there. So the line's fairly taut. I'm not pulling so hard that I'm pulling away that canopy. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this through the block. So watch there. Here is where I want my alpine butterfly knot. That's what I'm going to do next. The butterfly loop or alpine butterfly knot is perhaps the easiest to remember how to tie correctly. Start by simply making two twists in the same direction to form the two loops. Then wrap the outer loop around the standing part and pull it through the hole of the inner loop. There we go. I'm going to make this knot a little bit prettier here. My alpine knot's made right where I want it to be, nice and secure. We're going to show making the alpine butterfly knot one more time. Make one turn, then make a second turn or twist. Flip the loop over on top of the standing legs. Then hold the cross in the center, making a middle hole in the center position. Grasp the bottom of the outer loop and take the end back around the back and through the middle hole. And that gives you your alpine butterfly knot. I'm going to remove this. Now, this knot is pretty big, but we should be able to get it through our block, so let's try it. The blocks are not too small, and we're using an eighth inch line. There we go. Now we're on the underside of the block. Now I have to release one of these screws with my drill. Okay. So we've got that screw out. This is going to be a little bit on the hard side to move. Yeah, it moves pretty well. Now we're going to take our loop and we're going to run it underneath the leg of that strap eye, just like that. Then we're going to put our screw back in again. Okay, good. Now, that's step eight. 
Now we take this line and feed it on the other side of our panel. Our line is taut, and you'll notice when I pull on this line, our knot is right where I want it, right at the bottom of that block. So now we'll go to the other side of the pergola. All right, step nine is to take the end of the line, ow, and go through the top portion of this double block, going that way. Pull the line through. All right, now we're gonna go over this cable. Now make sure the cable, when you pull on it, there's no cross sections here. There's a little cross section here, but it's not a big deal. It's not gonna cause any friction issues. Just crossed once there. We'll also go on the top of this cable. Now, step 10 is to go through this double block through the bottom and pull all the line through again. As you can see, when the, light, the rope is pulled fairly taut, it's a straight run all the way to this block. Step 11, we have to go all the way to that end again. Step 11, through the top of this block. Be sure not to go behind that cable, but instead to go on top of it like that. Now pull the line through. Step 12, tied to the strap eye on the front of this panel. Be sure that the cable is, or the rope is taut and then determine where your alpine butterfly knot will go. We want it right underneath this block, so right about, I'm gonna put it right about there. Yep, that should do it. So if my loop is there, I'll be able to attach that strap by and it'll be nice and taut. So now I'll mark that location with my bread twisty tie. So that location is marked where I want the loop to go, pull it through my block, being sure it doesn't move, so that I have access to make my alpine butterfly knot. Now we'll pull on this, pulling this knot through the pulley. Watch closely up here. The pulley's big enough that I can get it through without any effort. Now I've already released one of the screws on this strap eye. So I'm gonna twist the strap eye, put it under it, and then reinstall the screw. There we go. Next step, number 13, through the top of this double block. Our rope is getting smaller and we don't have any twists. We have a single twist here, but it's not a big deal as we talked about earlier. So now we come across and keep going that direction. I'm gonna go over that and over this. There are no twists anywhere. Number 14 is through the bottom of this double block. Good. Number 15, tie it off at the strap eye on our first panel that we started with. Let's go over there. Number 15, put the rope through the single pad eye making sure that you go top of the wire. There's where we want our bowline knot to be, so when the rope is pulled taut, it'll tie to that strap eye. So I'm gonna give myself about 12 inches of line and cut it, because we have extra line that we included, just to be safe. Then we're gonna use a lighter, a hot knife. This I'm using a small torch to melt the end of the rope being sure that you don't do that by any fabric. Now that's not gonna come unraveled on us. Now all we have to do is tie into the strap eye. Okay, we cut our line one more time. There we go. 
that side's already sealed. Now we're going to grab the side of the panel that I'm going to attach to the other side. We'll be climbing up there and attaching it so it's locked on that side. So we'll do this with each panel. Okay, we have our panels here. To lock our panels, we're going to take this hook, unhook it from the cable, and hook it into there. Same thing over here. Unhook it from the cable, snap it in there. We'll do that with all the other ones now. Works awesome. Now we can control all three panels with one line. For some assurance to be sure that our system does not move in high winds, or if we want to make sure that it's fully closed all the way to the ends, we can use one of these Harkin 471 micro carbo cam cleats. We do not need to pre-drill holes. If you did, you could use the bottom portion of this cleat as a template to pre-drill holes. I prefer to install the cleat close to the cheek block directly above from it, approximately five inches above it. I also prefer for the gate to open this direction. That allows me to force the line in by pulling down. I'm using <clears throat> number eight stainless steel pan head screws. My length is about an inch and a quarter. Now, when I make adjustments, if I want the shades to stay all the way open, all the way at the other end, I can just pull it all the way back. And then I can simply drop it in there and it will stay all the way to the end. Our slide on wire hung canopies are now complete. Our wire hung canopies are obviously installed in a pergola, but you can also attach this type of canopy to a solid building. We typically call those freestanding wire hung canopies. Now that our project's done, we have the shade, even on those very sunny days, to provide us with a very comfortable outdoor living space. Coming up next is the materials lists and the tools that we used, including some common household tools. We highly recommend that you use the calculator that was designed for these wire hung canopies. It will tell you exactly what materials to order and the quantities from Sailrite. With that said, here is a detailed list of all the materials and tools. You may want to pause the video here to study these three pages of materials and tools. After using the calculator for the slide-on wire hung canopies, you'll know exactly what materials to order and the quantities of each for your particular application. If you have any questions, be sure to give us a call or email us at Sailrite. This free video and the hundreds of other project videos that are free are available from Sailrite, and it's your loyal patronage to Sailrite that makes these free videos available. So thanks for your loyal support. I'm Eric Grant, and from all of us here at Sailrite, thanks for watching.